Occupational English Test Listening Test 1 This test has three parts. In each part, you'll hear a number of different extracts. At the start of each extract, you'll hear this sound. You'll have time to read the questions before you hear each extract. And you'll hear each extract once only. Complete your answers as you listen. At the end of the test, you'll have two minutes to check your answers. Part A In this part of the test, you'll hear two different extracts. In each extract, a health professional is talking to a patient. For questions 1 to 24, Complete the notes with information you hear. Now look at the notes for extract 1. Extract 1. Questions 1 to 12. You hear a knee specialist talking to a new patient called Jason Riley. For questions 1 to 12, complete the notes with a word or short phrase. You now have 30 seconds to look at the notes. So, Mr. Riley, you've been referred to me because of um, a problem with your knee, is that correct? Uh, yes, it's my right knee. It's very painful. OK. I've got some information here from your GP, who's treated you for bursitis. But can you tell me about how this developed and what's happened so far? Mm. Well, about two years ago now, my knee, uh, this knee, swelled up and was really big. Mm -hmm. It didn't hurt, and it, well, it just looked really strange. Um, I'd been on a week's golf holiday in Portugal, and the knee was a bit dodgy all the time I was there. Uh, well, when I got home and the wife saw it, she sent me off to the GP straight away, who said that it was what people used to call housemaid's knee. <laughs> that caused a few laughs at home, I can tell you. <laughs> Then I remembered that my mum used to get that in her shoulder. Uh, it's really called bursitis, isn't it? Yes. But he said not to worry, to rest up a bit and wait and see if it went away. And it did in a few weeks. Right. So I was OK for a while. Then about a year ago, I got a new job. I used to be a, a painter and decorator, but I retrained as a carpet fitter. So I'm on my knees quite a bit. Uh, goes with the job. And after a while... Uh, this must be about six months ago, the knee swelled up again. It looked really red this time, and I had a sort of dull pain as well that got worse. OK. Uh, also, I felt slightly shivery and feverish. The GP said I probably had an infection and gave me some antibiotics for 10 days or so. That seemed to do the trick, and I felt much better, but the knee was still a bit swollen, and it ached sometimes. Did you try painkillers? Oh, yeah. After a bit, the doctor suggested ibuprofen, but that always seemed to give me a tummy upset, oh. so I stuck to paracetamol. Mm -hmm. I'm still using them on and off. At work, they put me on to doing things that didn't need a lot of kneeling when I first went back, but only temporarily. Uh, and I put ice packs on my knee to bring down the swelling as often as I could every few hours. I tried to take breaks too. Oh, and my GP suggested some exercises to protect the knee, uh, lying down on my back and raising the leg. Yes. Which seems to reduce the aching. Mm -hmm. In bed, I made sure I slept with a pillow under it to keep it a bit higher up too. And um, was your knee still swollen? Yeah, it was. So then the doctor drained off some of the fluid by sticking in a needle. I remember he said he got 20 millilitres out. Right. After that, he suggested that I try some supports in my shoes. 
I couldn't really see the point of that, but apparently it's to do with your arches, which I guess does affect your knees. Yes. Also, he told me to make sure that I have plenty of padding on my knees when I'm at work, and I've been doing that. Good. Uh, he told me that I should think about losing a good few kilos as well, but I like my food, as you can see, mm. and I haven't made any progress with that so far. But things weren't getting better, so then he started giving me cortisone injections. Uh, I've had three of those so far. And what effect did they have? They really helped. Much less swelling and the pain's better too. But that's the problem. He now says that with those sorts of drugs, you can't have more than three of them in the same knee in a year. I'm up to the limit and it, and it keeps coming back. So, so really, I'm hoping you'll be able to come up with something better. OK, well, let's have a look, shall we? Mm. If you can... Extract 2. Questions 13 to 24. You hear a neurologist talking to a new patient called Sylvia Gunn. For questions 13 to 24, complete the notes with a word or short phrase. You now have 30 seconds to look at the notes. Hello, Mrs. Gunn. You've been referred to me because of some pain in your face. Now, I've got some notes from your GP, but perhaps you can tell me in your own words about the pain, uh, when it started, and what's happened since? Well, it began about three years back. Uh, out of the blue, I got this terrible shooting pain in a back tooth. Mm -hmm. I've never felt anything like it before in my life. Oh. Um, see... It was a tooth I'd had a nasty abscess on a few years before, and I assumed that it had got infected again. Anyway, I went off to the dentist as soon as I could get an appointment. So right. he did some x-rays, but he couldn't find anything wrong, which was very strange. Was the pain continuous, and did anything in particular trigger it? Oh... Uh, it came and went, and it lasted just a minute or so each time, but it really got bad when I brushed my teeth. I always use an electric toothbrush. Um, they're so much better than the usual sort, but yes. it didn't like that one little bit. Um, I even tried to persuade the dentist to whip the tooth out there and then oh. because I was so sure that that was the problem. But he told me he was pretty sure there was nothing wrong with my teeth at all and I ought to see my GP. And your GP has diagnosed trigeminal neuralgia? Well... First of all, the GP told me to try painkillers. Mm. That was to exclude things like a migraine, I think. But the pills, they didn't have any effect at all. So mm. then he sent me off for a CT scan mm -hmm. because he said it might be a very bad case of sinusitis. I'd had that before when I was a teenager. Uh -huh. um, or he said even nerve damage. But that was all negative too. So then after all that, the GP eventually put me on an anti-epilepsy drug which seemed to help. I see. Uh, so how is it now? Well, the pain sometimes goes away for weeks at a time, but then it can come back uh, a dozen times a day. Oh. Fortunately, I get a tingling feeling in my jaw when it's going to start, which I can recognise as a sign. So at least I get a bit of warning before the pain comes on properly, um, and I can try to find somewhere quiet to sit down. But the pain has now begun to spread. Yes. It started to happen in my eye, too, mm -hmm. on the same side as the tooth. Mm -hmm. I was doing okay until the firm where I work moved to a new office. It's a lovely new building, um, and everything was fine at first until about three months ago when the weather started to improve mm -hmm. and they turned up the air conditioning because yes. <laughs> lots of people were complaining about being too hot. That's when I started getting pains in the eye, and I'm pretty sure it's connected. 
But the system's the same all over the building, and it's not as if I'm sitting in a draft, so there's not much I can do about it. I've tried wearing glasses all the time, and that seemed to help a bit, at least at the beginning. And these pains in the eye, tell me how long they last and how often you get them. Mm, it's getting worse and worse. Over the last fortnight, it's been every day and sometimes every hour, and it's really excruciating. Mm -hmm. It's getting me down, and I've started losing weight too, what with the worry and the pain, and I've had to give up my yoga class, which I loved, because you never know when the pain's going to come on. And, well, that's making me feel very isolated. Um, I really hope you can do something more for me, Doctor. That is the end of Part A. Now look at Part B. Part B. In this part of the test, you'll hear six different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear people talking in a different healthcare setting. The questions 25 to 30 Choose the answer, A, B or C, which fits best, according to what you hear. You'll have time to read each question before you listen. Complete your answers as you listen. Now look at question 25. You hear two nurses conducting a patient handover. Now read the question. Mrs. Garner is a 73-year-old who came in because of an exacerbation of COPD. This is day three. Today she's down for a repeat chest x-ray, and that's all booked in, and her leg dressings need to be done. She has bilateral ulcers. Mm -hmm. Oh, and you'd better chase up the report on her sputum sample. We should have had that back by now. OK. There's a history of ischemic heart disease and type 2 diabetes, peripheral vascular disease and peripheral neuropathy. She's been treated with IV antibiotics, steroids and nebulizers. She's mobile with a walking frame but gets breathless. She's down as high risk for falls. Sure. I'll continue to monitor her fluid intake and check that she sticks to the diabetic diet. Great. Question 26. You hear a GP talking to a patient. Now read the question. So, shall we have a look at your blood test result? So, what we're testing for is the level of haemoglobin in your blood. And just to show you, the normal range for women is between 11.5 and 16 grams per deciliter. Oh, yes. And this is your level of haemoglobin. It's 8.7. Oh, I see. And what this tells us is that you're suffering from iron deficiency anemia. Oh, yes. I thought that might be the case. That would account for the lack of energy and the um, lethargy. Mm. I think that's what you called it last time. Mm. So perhaps I need to look at my diet, uh, increase my iron intake? Well, what I'd like you to consider is taking a course of iron tablets. This can be a really effective treatment for the condition, and what it does is it supplements the amount of iron you're getting in your diet. So does that mean I can go on eating normally? Not necessarily. I think we'd better run through what that phrase means in your case before I answer that question. OK. Question 27. You hear a senior nurse briefing a colleague about working in the recovery room. Now read the question.
Okay, so this is the recovery room where you'll be working. Patients come here directly from theatre. It's their first stage recovery before going back to the ward. Here we have a monitor, and on that you can see all the patients' vital signs from theatre, okay? Right. So you check that it's on and functioning, mm -hmm. attach the BP cuff and pulse oximeter, and you're ready to make your assessment. The system then prompts you in terms of what to do next with the patient. Uh, so do they get extubated in theatre? Mm, it depends. Mostly they do, and that's ideal. But sometimes it happens outside. If they come out with an ET tube in place, then it's probably because the doctors want to keep it there during recovery. Uh -huh. But if it's a laryngeal mask, then the anaesthetist will see to that. We just have to ensure that the patient's kept stable. Question 28. You hear a dentist talking to a patient. Now read the question. OK, so today I'm going to prepare the tooth for the fitting of the crown, then take an impression. Oh, really? I thought I was having the tooth filled. Have I got the wrong end of the stick, then? OK, well, if you remember, last time you were here, we discussed the various options for the tooth because there's already a big filling in it that's fractured. Yeah, and I thought you said you'd be replacing the metal filling with a tooth-coloured filling made out of some sort of composite material. Oh, yes, I see. Actually, what we discussed was either a new metal filling, which may or may not stand the test of time because there's going to be a lot of stress on what's left of that tooth, or go for a tooth-coloured crown instead, which would be more robust. And is that what you quoted for in terms of the price? Oh, yes. Oh, OK. Let's go for it, then. Question 29. You hear a triage nurse in the emergency department talking to a doctor. Now read the question. Excuse me, Doctor. I'm getting concerned about one of the patients I've triaged this evening. He came in with pain in his right shoulder going down the arm, and I put him down for an ECG and blood work. Mm -hmm. But he's now saying he feels feverish, and he's asking me how long it's going to be before you can see him. I see. Uh, how long's he been waiting? Around half an hour. Uh, the thing is, he's got an infected wound on his leg. Says he's had it for a while, and it doesn't seem to want to heal. He didn't tell me about this initially. I've looked at the wound, and there's clearly inflammation and some discharge, but what's worrying me is that his speech is getting rather slurred, mm -hmm. so I'm concerned that it might be sepsis. I think we should move him up the list. OK. Uh, thanks for flagging this up. I'll take a look at him straight away. Question 30. You hear an eye surgeon briefing some new staff at the eye clinic. Now read the question. One of the biggest challenges for us can be deciding what's normal and what isn't. Looking at the back of people's eyes, as we do all day, what strikes you is the enormous variety of shapes and sizes you see there. The optic nerve may be oval, it may be round, or it can be irregular in shape, and all of that can be perfectly normal. So we get lots of referrals, particularly of children, where an optometrist observed something a bit funny at the back of the eye, and they want us to check it out. Well, that's fine. If they are on the side of caution, that's better than missing things. And from our point of view, it's all worthwhile. After all, it's only by looking at a great many healthy eyes that you learn to diagnose the problems that we need to deal with.
That is the end of part B. Now look at part C. Part C. In this part of the test, you'll hear two different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear health professionals talking about aspects of their work. For questions 31 to 42, choose the answer A, B or C, which fits best according to what you hear. Complete your answers as you listen. Now look at Extract 1. Extract 1. Questions 31 to 36. You will hear an interview with a dietitian called Ben Melrose, who's talking about iodine deficiency. You now have 90 seconds to read questions 31 to 36. My guest today is a dietitian called Ben Melrose, and today we're going to be talking about iodine deficiency and some of the medical consequences of that. Ben, iodine is a trace element that's found in many foods. Mm. Why do some people not get enough? Well, in some parts of the world, this is an endemic problem, and it's not a question of dietary choice. We get iodine from various sources, like there's iodine in eggs and dairy foods, but by far the biggest source is the ocean. Fish that live in salt water and plants that grow in that environment are our main source of iodine. So we see relatively few cases of deficiency in Europe, for example, because such foods are plentiful there. But elsewhere, typically in the middle of large continents, it's a different story. There, people simply don't have access to sources of natural iodine. Obviously, poorer people in those regions are most likely to suffer deficiencies, but everyone's affected to some degree. And the consequences of iodine deficiency can be quite serious, I imagine. Yes. Uh, classic symptoms are things like muscular weakness, not being able to focus on the task in hand, and also a tendency to feel cold, even in hot weather. But the most widely reported symptom is actually a feeling of constant tiredness. Oh. Of course, there are tests that can determine the level of iodine in the body, and 150 micrograms is regarded as the minimum daily intake needed to avoid symptoms. And there are related conditions. A typical one is an enlarged thyroid, what's often called a goiter. So you've worked in South America, Ben, mm. where, where um, I think it's quite common to see patients with a goiter. That's right. The case of one of my own patients illustrates this very well. Let's call her Mirabelle. Mirabelle's a middle-aged woman whose home is high up in the Andes Mountains. She lived in Europe for a number of years, where she enjoyed a varied diet and good health. When she and her husband went back to their native country, however, they returned to a remote region and tended to revert to the local cuisine, which is lacking in iodine. As they hadn't suffered any of the symptoms of iodine deficiency before they left for Europe, they didn't feel any particular need to worry about their diet now. But I believe she developed a goiter. Well, what happened was she started to have problems sleeping. She'd wake up in the middle of the night with discomfort in her legs 
and then she started to get a sore throat. At first she assumed it was flu, but the symptoms persisted. Then one day she noticed a slight swelling on her neck. At first she couldn't believe it. The family were eating lots of river fish and fruit, so a diet that was healthy enough in many ways, but crucially lacking in iodine.、Mm. Knowing this, she'd been taking multivitamins since her return, so was initially sceptical until a test confirmed that this was the cause. So, were you able to help Mirabel? I was able to work out a diet for Mirabel that made the most of the natural sources of iodine that were available to her. I also encouraged her to eat Brazil nuts. These are a good source of selenium, which actually helps the body to absorb the traces of iodine which are present in other foods. Ah.、Oh. I also advised her to steer clear of certain processed foods, like bread made with flour improver, because these actually impede the body's ability to absorb iodine. I left it up to her whether or not she continued with the multivitamins.、Mm. So, what conclusions do you draw from Mirabel's case? What it made me think was that millions of people on this planet must be existing on the brink of iodine deficiency, and that's a cause for concern. Like Mirabel, when you're young, the body can cope, but this takes its toll with time. Another thought I had was: Did Mirabel become more susceptible to the effects of iodine deficiency? As a result of the iodine-rich diet she'd enjoyed in Europe, I couldn't say, but that certainly seems to warrant further study. Now look at extract two. Extract two, questions thirty-seven to forty-two. You will hear a plastic surgeon called Norma Woolston. Giving a presentation about surgical treatment for a condition called Dupuytren's contracture. You now have ninety seconds to read questions thirty-seven to forty-two. My name's Norma Woolston, and I'm talking today about surgery for a condition called Dupuytren's contracture, with a particular reference to a case I treated recently. Dupuytren was first described by a French physician of that name in 1834. It's a condition in which one finger becomes increasingly bent in a flexed position. The first sign is a formation of small hard nodules in the palm of the hand, but early diagnosis is relatively unusual because there is no associated discomfort. In its early stages, the condition may respond to steroid injections and physical therapy, but this doesn't necessarily halt its progression. The affected finger often becomes increasingly bent and can no longer be straightened. But patients tend to present with the condition only when manual dexterity is compromised, by which time surgical intervention is indicated. My patient, let's call him Eric, presented with quite an advanced case of Dupuytren's affecting the little finger of his right hand, a relatively common sight for the condition. 
although a physical examination revealed that he was also developing the first signs in the thumb on the same hand. Eric was then a 61-year-old office worker who used a keyboard regularly. There isn't very much published so far on the causes of the condition or what might exacerbate the symptoms, but the digital age doesn't appear to have resulted in an exponential rise in the number of cases reported. Eric was finding the condition inconvenient and uncomfortable rather than painful. It was becoming tricky shaking hands with people and holding a pencil was becoming a challenge. Eric didn't recall any family history of Dupuytrons. That's not unusual, but doesn't in itself mean that there was none. Indeed, we know that the condition is often present across the generations of one family. But because patients don't typically develop symptoms until late middle age or later, it often goes undiagnosed or doesn't develop to the point where it requires treatment. Indeed, mild symptoms are often attributed to mild arthritis or the general effects of ageing and wear and tear. Nor did Eric report any of the other associated risk factors, such as smoking, diabetes or low body mass index. It's worth noting, however, that he was of classic Northern European appearance, tall and fair-skinned and Dupuytrens is known to be much more common amongst Northern Europeans than in other populations. In Eric's case, the condition had progressed to the point where surgery was indicated. It was clear to me that what was required was a fasciotomy to straighten the finger. Eric had some misgivings about this, as he'd heard about less invasive treatment options, but I explained to him that, taking into account the extent of development of the diseased tissue and the specific site, this was the only option, and he agreed to go ahead with the procedure. Fortunately, Eric was generally in good health, was taking no medications for other conditions, and had no concerns or negative history relating to general anaesthetic. This was much the preferred option because... Although the surgery isn't lengthy, usually between 30 and 40 minutes, it does call for a complete immobilisation of the hand. After the procedure, Eric was using a sling and pillows at night to hold the wound site high up and so prevent a build-up of fluids. I'd explained that wearing a sling when out and about also provides a degree of general protection. It's a remarkably effective way of signalling to other people to keep their distance, as the hand is very sensitive to knocks. But actually, he'd taken plenty of time off work, so this hadn't been a problem for him. Indeed, when I saw Eric at the follow-up appointment, the wound was healing well. His notes showed, however, that the sutures hadn't all fully dissolved after surgery, and that this had been a source of discomfort. Worried that perhaps there was an infection, he'd consulted a nurse, who'd removed them and also taken the opportunity to excise some excess scar tissue, which had formed at the site. I reassured him that this was by no means unusual and wasn't a cause for concern. I was pleased to see that when he returned for the final consultation, Eric's wound had generally healed well. As is the case with many de Puitron's patients, however, Eric volunteered that, despite my careful explanation at our first consultation about the treatment and recuperation period, he'd entirely underestimated the impact of the surgery on his daily life and how long the disruption would continue. That said, his finger is now much straighter. This treatment for Dupuytrons never completely straightens the finger, nor restores full use, but he'd been aware of that from the outset and had no complaints on that score. So far, apart from the initial indications in his thumb, there is no sign of recurrence, although this is relatively common, especially over time. I reflected, however, that perhaps being very familiar with the condition and having performed this kind of surgery many times, I hadn't made it clear enough to Eric exactly what to expect after the surgery. What Eric's case made me realise is that I...
That is the end of part C. You now have two minutes to check your answers. That is the end.